Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors episode 89. I'm your host Natalie Gruniger and it's great to have your company. As always, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and thanking the wonderful listeners who continue to support this podcast via Podbean Patron and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. Your support is very much appreciated. If you love the podcast and never miss an episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. It's easy to do. Just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family, and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor-themed goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. October's prize is a set of three Tudor-themed Christmas decorations designed by artist Catherine Holman. With Christmas just around the corner, you might like to check out ColoringTudorHistory.com for a range of gifts that will delight any Tudor history lover. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about Cardinal Thomas Wolsey is Dr. Glenn Richardson. Dr. Richardson is Professor of Early Modern History at St. Mary's University in Twickenham, London. He's a graduate of the University of Sydney, Australia, and completed his PhD at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Glenn's research interests have centred on Renaissance kingship, Anglo-French diplomatic and cultural relations, masculinity and kingship, and also cardinals and the papacy in the Renaissance. He's the author of Renaissance Monarchy, the reigns of Henry VIII, Francis I and Charles V. He's the editor of The Contending Kingdoms, England and France, 1420 to 1700. And with Susan Doran, the editor of Tudor England and its Neighbours. In 2014, he published The Field of Cloth of Gold with Yale University Press about the 1520 meeting between Henry VIII and Francis I. It was issued in paperback for the COVID-19 affected anniversary of the event in June 2020. In July 2020, he published Woolsey for the Routledge Taylor Francis historical biography series, of which he has also recently become the editor. He's currently planning a court biography of the reign of Henry VIII. My conversation with Glenn straight after this musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sayles. (laughs) 
welcome to Talking Tudors, Glenn. How are you? Thank you very much, Natalie. I'm very well, thank you. It's lovely to finally have you on the show. Now, I think a good place to start is by you perhaps introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling them a little bit about your background. I am Professor of Early Modern History now at St Mary's University in West London, which is a small Catholic university. I've been there for quite a long time. I'm originally from, like you, I'm Australian, although I know I don't sound it. I come from Sydney originally, and I did my first degree at Sydney University and uh, in history, arts and majored in history. Uh, And then as I was finishing that, I um, met uh, someone who has had uncertain uh, public fortunes just at the moment, Dr. David Starkey, who has run into a bit of controversy here in Britain in the last couple of months, but even then a very renowned Tudor historian. And I became his PhD student at the uh, London University, the London School of Economics, where he was then. And I did my doctorate on, what was it, Anglo-French political and cultural relations in the reign of Henry VIII. That's a mouthful, that one. (laughs) It was. It got a laugh. It it got a laugh at the graduation ceremony. Uh, Mainly, I think, because people could vaguely understand it compared to some of the titles that were read out. Anyway. So uh, I did that and uh, did various teaching jobs and then I eventually got a lectureship at St Mary's and and have been there ever since. My areas of research are obviously Anglo-French relations in general. I'm a great fan of uh, Francis I. In fact, I'm I'm much more friendly about Francis than about Henry VIII. And in doing that, it got me into obviously people like Woolsey, like events like the Field of Cloth of Gold on which I've written, etc. Um, and I think we'll talk about. But um, uh, generally, my interest has been monarchy, how monarchy works, what Renaissance monarchy is about. My first book a long time ago was called Renaissance Monarchy, and it compared Henry VIII, Francis I, and Charles V. If I were writing the book today, I'd include uh, Suleiman, the Sultan of the Ottoman Turks, as as well. But um, so I think I think that's enough. I think that's a kind of potted history of where I am and what I've done. Now your most recent um, book is a biography of Cardinal Thomas Woolsey, so what drew you to his story in particular? Uh, Well as I said I I met Woolsey so to speak through Henry VIII and uh, my studies in the court of of Henry and of course Woolsey is utterly central to the conduct of Henry VIII's foreign policy as well as much else uh, in the first 20 years of his reign. As I say at opening the book, that you, you can't understand Woolsey without Henry VIII, and you certainly can't understand Henry VIII properly uh, without Woolsey. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in ministers and, and that first echelon of government anyway, the people who aren't wearing the crown, but who actually run the show in many ways. What motivates them? And you know, I'm interested in the, the, Woolsey's French equivalents and things. So, and then the more I read about him, the more this mixture of his obscure origins, his incredible capacity for work, his imaginative handling of Henry, both domestically and all the things he does for him, and also internationally, just made him uh, a fascinating character. And uh, I, I never seemed to get time to do much on him earlier. And so when the opportunity for, was offered to me from Routledge to write a biography in their historical biography series, um, I thought, yes. So that's that's the series in which it has appeared, I think, in July or August this year it came out. Okay, and so for our listeners that perhaps don't know too much about Woolsey's early life, you already mentioned it comes from quite obscure origins. So what do we actually know about that period? Very little. We don't even know exactly when he was born. It was sometime in the early 1470s, uh, could be 1470-71 or a bit later, 1472. The convention, which I don't necessarily go along with, is I think we sort of say 1472 because it's about in the middle of um, <laughs> a number of possibilities. I won't go into why there are all these various possibilities, but it was about then. And uh, he grew up in the small uh, Suffolk uh, town of Ipswich, but even then it was beginning to become more important commercially uh, as a trading town close to the, to the, to the coast. And uh, he had what we might think of as a, a yeoman or, or um, kind of shopkeeper background. His, his father is often described, the, the famous slur against him what, that was that he was the butcher's cur, you know, butcher's dog. Yes, his father did do some butchery business, but he, he wasn't sort of standing there in an apron selling sausages on, you know, from his shop window kind of thing, as we imagine a modern butcher. But, but he, he was a kind of small time 
businessman. He had uh, some property. He uh, did some ale housekeeping, ale making, got um, the wrong side of some of the uh, hygiene and trading regulations. Yes, they did have them uh, in the 16th century. Uh, and so that's how we know a bit about him. And his mother, uh, Joan, was from slightly better, as it were, um, social social stock. The, the Dondies had been, well, they were kind of more up-and-coming merchant types. Uh, and her, her brother had been an MP at one point uh, and may have been quite helpful in financing Wolsey's early education and... Um, is going to uh, to Oxford and, and things like that. So it's it's a kind of mix. Uh, again, perhaps in some ways they're quite typical of, of families of, of mixed backgrounds in in early 16th century. And Wolsey is much more typical of boys of his background than is sometimes realised. In that education, the opportunities for education, sadly for boys rather than boys and girls, but certainly boys. Uh, were becoming more frequent in the later 15th, early 16th century for boys of, of that background if they showed talent. And Woolsey was certainly one of those. Yes, he was clearly very talented. I, I really want to talk to you about his rise to power under Henry VIII, which was quite exceptional. And how and why did Woolsey become so central? You mentioned you can't understand Henry without Woolsey or Woolsey without Henry. So can you talk us through that a little bit, how he rose through the ranks mm. and why he was so important to Henry? Well, I think uh, clearly he, he has, one of the things which I said about him by his first sympathetic biographer, George Cavendish, who was in the 1520s, was his um, gentleman usher, so like a, a personal attendant, was that he had what Cavendish called a filed tongue. That is, he was very articulate and uh, eloquent when he spoke, probably gained that uh, from his earliest days in, you know, the little uh, petty school that he went to. Um, certainly would have been developed in, in his studies in theology at Oxford, the capacity to, to debate to propositions, to defend them, which was all part of the way theology was taught. A natural ability, I think, uh, developed by education. And he was noticed by a series of courtiers uh, at Henry VII's court, uh, the most important of, I mean, he became eventually, uh, he was uh, the chaplain to Sir Richard Nanfan, who was the uh, deputy of, of Calais, in other words, the, the man who was in charge of Calais. And that's, according to Cavendish, when uh, Wolsey really begins to show his capacities because Sir Richard had been involved in politics in England. He was also involved in negotiations with the Low Countries at, at the time that Woolsey worked for him. This is in the early 1500s. And uh, according to Cavendish, Anand Fan left the whole charge of his duties at Calais to Woolsey, which can't literally be true. But what he probably meant was that, that um, Nan Fan was able to delegate a whole range of ordinary domestic stuff that had to be done, you know, administrative tasks, appointments, looking after this and the other, and he was able to, to give it to Woolsey, and it's that kind of training. Uh, he also had worked for uh, William Dean, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for a time as, as chaplain. He eventually made it in, uh, into the household of Henry VII as a, a chaplain, and as chaplain, of course, he would have done religious services and things, but as a chaplain, he, he had a sort of roving brief to do whatever the king needed him to do. So he was perhaps more like an aide or a, or a secretary, a PA, as we might now think of him. And again, according to Cavendish, famously, he once was sent on a mission to the Netherlands uh, in respect of, of some marriage negotiations, which Henry VII was then conducting with the Emperor Maximilian and Margaret of Savoy, and apparently went there, did whatever he was required to do, and further the negotiations, more than his instructions, um, even said he should, and got back to England all within the space of since about three days. <laughs> Again, the kind of shuttle diplomacy, Henry Kissinger in the making. I think we can be a bit sceptical about just how quick it was, but it probably was you know, relatively swift. And again, for, for Cavendish and his narrative of, of Wolsey's life, this is an intimation of these qualities. So competence, competence over a range of things, but also the, we might say, the chutzpah or the, or the gumption to... To, to take things on, you know, to take a risk, um, which I think probably made him, to those around, uh, you know, the, the circles of the king, probably an interesting, perhaps even slightly intimidating kind of character. And eventually, well, after Henry VII's uh, death in 1509, um, he's about 40, again, we're not sure about the exact age, but he's around about 40-ish, 
So he's, he's not any longer a spring chicken, um, but he attracts the, um, the attention of, of Henry, who makes him, not immediately, but, but towards the end of 1509, makes him the royal almoner, uh, who is responsible formally for the king's charitable giving. So the king gives certain amounts of money on at certain occasions uh, throughout the year and, and in general other ways. So he has a kind of roving brief to, to look after all of that. But again, it, it gives him a, a, an entry and most importantly, a place on the royal council to which he's called when it has need of him. And clearly his appearances when called made such an impression that he's called more and more frequently and asked about more and more issues. Um, he certainly impressed um, Richard Fox, who was Bishop of Winchester at the time and keeper of the, the, the Privy Seal. So it, responsible for the, the, the daily business of the Royal Council. Uh, and so Wolsey impressed him. He may have met him at, uh, at Oxford at Magdalen College where he was uh, studying. And it looks as if Fox took Wolsey particularly under his wing and smoothed his path onto the Royal Council in the hopes that Wolsey would support the kinds of policies and the kinds of approaches to government that Fox advocated. And in brief, they were good, orderly administration, you know, of the kind Henry VII um, said at least he was famous for, and, and which Fox played a part in, so he wanted Woolsey's help with that. Um, good, orderly running of the church and things, uh, and a very, not passive, but a very peaceful, effective foreign policy. In other words, no adventurers in France or anything like that. That's how I think Woolsey gets into Henry's circle, but Henry very quickly notices the uh, intelligence and clearly the, the, the wit and the eloquence of this man. And to cut an even longer story short, Wolsey sees that the best way forward is really not to do what, what, what Fox wants directly, but what Henry wants. Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, what, what the king wants, he gets. And Wolsey's able to say, well, I can do that for you. And the main issue for Henry uh, in, this is about 1510, 1511, as his reign is beginning to, to progress, is that the Royal Council is dead set on good administration and everything going by this incredibly complicated <laughs> administrative procedure whereby the council can basically keep tabs on the young king. Remember, Henry's only 17, 18 at this point. Uh, and, and all these men are in their 40s and 50s. Um, so they, they're trying to keeping Henry not quite like a schoolboy king, but because it's, it's more than that. Uh, he, he, he's in full sovereignty, he's, he's doing all these things, all he's jousting, all that kind of stuff he likes doing. But in terms of government, they're trying to kind of coach him into yeah. what they think good kingship should be about. Yeah. And Henry finds that very tedious. Um, and, uh, and Wolsey, I think, often gives the impression at the council and to Henry himself when he speaks that well, he will look after things for him if, if he will tr entrust him with greater responsibility. And nobody knows exactly how, but by about, as I said, about 1511 or so, it's clear that Wolsey is the, is the dominant force now on the council. He's not formally the most senior member of the Royal Council, but he is clearly the one that everyone looks to for the lead on anything. And Henry begins to look to him and he to Henry. So they form a kind of two-man partnership. And I would argue that that's how it stays right through to the 1520s, that there is, uh, that they're a joint team that, that run the country with everybody else and in consultation with the council, etc. But essentially, the, the real basics of policy in, in domestic and foreign policy are, s are settled by Henry and, uh, and Wolsey. Uh, and it is that capacity to to give Henry what he wants to, to make him understand and to make what he wants understood to others, that is the key to Wolsey's early success. Now, Glenn, speaking about foreign policy, let's stay with that for, for a moment, but fast forward about a decade into the future to the early 1520s. Can you tell us right. a little bit about Wolsey and of course the very famous field of cloth of gold? What was his role in, in that? Well, the, uh, the field of cloth of gold was in fact a tournament uh, held to inaugurate a universal peace and an Anglo-French agreement which had been made two years earlier in 1518, known as the, the Treaty of, of Universal Peace or the Treaty of London. It, it itself arose from uh, a complicated set of, of circumstances whereby uh, Leo X, the Pope, Leo X, 
saw that the Ottomans were on the rise uh, in the east, saw that there was a lot of dissension between uh, princes in the west and wanted to have a, a truce so that uh, in, in the manner of popes going back to Urban II, um, that if, it, if all the Christian princes could come together, they could then, you know, sink their differences and, and, and fight the Turk. Now, that was the ostensible reason for it. But what Wolsey is really doing is trying to put Henry VIII at the forefront of international um, affairs. That's something he'd been doing right back at the start. Uh, Henry's first war, which he starts in 1512, an invasion of France, and uh, that goes on into 1513 when he personally leads an army to France. That had been begun against the advice, initially, of the Royal Council, but with Wolsey's encouragement, and had been fairly successful for Henry. He'd, he'd got the town of Terouanne and the rather prestigious city of Tournai. So he'd, he'd made a start as this great European warrior prince that he wanted to be as a young man with Wolsey's assistance. His allies on during that war, Ferdinand of Aragon and the Emperor Maximilian, uh, encouraged him into it, but then they sank their differences with, with King Louis XII of France, their enemy, leaving Henry high and dry with, with no, no means to continue the war. So, and this is the important point, is what Wolsey does first in 1514 is he convinces Henry that, well, if you can't make magnificent warfare in the way that you want to do and would impress everybody, why not make peace in, in such a magnificent way, in such a shocking way that it will you know, impress everybody in a, in a different kind of um, context? And that's exactly what happens in the first Treaty of London, where, as you'll know, Mary Tudor, uh, Henry's sister, uh, is married to Louis XII, uh, completely turning on its head the, the, the anti-French alliance of the previous year to a situation which has never happened before, where the King of England and the King of France are allied together, uh, and that marriage seals the, the alliance. And that itself was quite amazing. And you can trace the, the influence of Wolsey uh, on Henry to, to bring this about. So that becomes the model, in a sense, for everything that happens thereafter. Unfortunately for Louis, he dies um, in the, uh, we start 1515, 1st of January, and is succeeded by Francis I, Francis of Angoulême, with whom there is an immediate sense of competition with Henry. He's about four years younger, he's just as handsome, just as, you know, talented uh, as, as, as hunting, uh, and what is even worse is he's much better at war than Henry, because within far, uh, nine months of his accession, he takes a huge army over the Alps and conquers uh, the Duchy of Milan, becomes, which Henry got himself a town and a city. Well, well done, good, good lad. Um, <laughs> but Francis got himself most of Northern Italy you know, um, as, uh, as, as his prize. And there's this intense rivalry, which is set up quite quickly between these two youngish kings. And Francis makes all the running and Henry is somewhat isolated in that period from 1515 to 1517. Then, to pick up where I was before, that's when Leo's plan for a, a crusade, as we might call it, comes in. And that's the way that Wolsey sees Henry being brought back into the international stage and, and to the forefront. So, in order to understand, I had to go through that in order to understand the real meaning of the 1518 piece. The Cloth of Gold is the first time the two of them meet, and this intense rivalry means that they want to impress each other with their capabilities. I mean, they, they meet as allies and as friends. So, of course, uh, it's, a, it's a tournament. They never joust against each other. That would be too dangerous. But instead, they, they jointly host the, the tournament as the challengers uh, against all comers, who are mixed teams of English and French knights. So the whole thing is um, a celebration of chivalry. It's a celebration of, you know, the best things about uh, monarchy. It's about uh, Christian brotherhood, um, international peace, all these good things that people like Erasmus and others can all go on about and say how marvellous. But what it's really doing is allowing both sides, I think, I certainly argue in my book, that what it's about is both kings showing off to the other, well, this is, look at all, I've, I've brought 5,000 odd people with me here. I've built this temporary palace. I've set up you know, these huge uh, you know, towns of, of cloth of gold tents where we're all in. If this is what I'm doing to express my, my affection for you as my brother and my ally, uh, imagine what I can do to you when you decide that we're not friends. And I think both of them are trying to persuade, but also to convince the other 
that it really is worth uh, being allied together because the stakes for Francis are just as high uh, as they are for Henry because of the third of our Renaissance monarchs that I mentioned, namely the Emperor Charles V, who by this time is developing a preponderant power in Western Europe, which frightens Francis rather a lot. Not so much for France, but for Milan. He's desperate that Charles won't take Milan off him and he needs Henry's support. Equally, well, Henry says, well, okay, I'll help you, but you've got to acknowledge that I am the real king of France. You've got to pay me an enormous amount of money each year, as, as Henry calls it, as tribute for his kingdom of France. Um, and you've got to keep me, you know, at the forefront of things. And that's what the, that's what the field of cloth of gold was politically um, all about. Um, so the cost, the extravagance, the, the scale of it, is all part of the, the message. Just to finish with an analogy, um, if it's not too far back now, we all remember the marvelous Sydney Olympics. Hey, we all remember the marvelous um, London Olympics, you know, um, with red buses and all the rest of it in the opening ceremony. But there was nothing like the 2008 Beijing Olympics opening ceremony. This astonishing display of people of material or the whole story of, his, of Chinese history, that, which made no mention of the Communist Party or, or anything, but about gunpowder and, you know, there was the voyages of Zheng He and paper developments and fireworks, all a, a kind of very particular national narrative was being sold in an extravagant way to a huge international audience to say, we're here and we're not going anywhere and <laughs> you better get on with us, was really what that uh, so just as the Chinese were telling us that uh, they wanted peace and friendship, but on their terms, something very similar was happening in, f in 1520 um, at the Field of Cloth of Gold. Yeah, that's an excellent analogy. And, and I think that rivalry that you mentioned continued on for the, the whole reign, didn't it? And the, the little triangle with Charles is quite intriguing, really, all the things they got up to. And Charles actually pops in, doesn't he, to see Henry just before he's on his way, just to um, make sure he's not forgotten. That's right, yes. And that, I think that is actually the way to think about it, funnily enough, at this point, because uh, Charles will, of course, eventually become the dominant power and uh, who, would, who would not want to include him. But in 1520, I mean, Charles is 20, so he's the younger of the three. Uh, he's never met Catherine um, or Henry before, never shown much sign of doing so. But yes, he became very alarmed at the prospect of, a, of an Anglo-French alliance of real meaning. So, yes, he was sailing back up from uh, Spain to the Netherlands to make his way towards his, um, not coronation, but, but recognition as, as the elected emperor. He was elected in 1519 against Francis. So, yeah, he, he has, took the opportunity to call in, see Auntie Cathy and Uncle Henry. Um, <laughs> hello, here I am. Uh, and secures the, the promise that, he, that Henry will meet him immediately afterwards. And at that meeting, his ministers do try to get Wolsey and Henry to break any agreement with Francis and to ally with Charles. And Wolsey won't, and Henry, I think they do play, you know, a fairly straight bat to these proposals. No, we're going to do this. Um, we, we, we're serious about universal peace. You know, you can't just disrupt it. So, And after a while, it becomes obvious that actually you can, and they, they will have to ally with him. But that's not the case in 1520. People are very, I think they're too, too ready to read back into 1520 what happens three or four years later. All right, fabulous. We could talk about, you know, all that forever, but we're going to move on a little bit. So Wolsey was yes. also, of course, a great patron of the arts and of education. Can you tell us a little bit about this side of his life and his educational, artistic, his architectural interests and his patronage? That would be really great because I don't think we hear about that very often. No, um, uh, I think you're right. That, that's one of the things that um, I've tried to do in this book, which is the first single volume biography to kind of pull that in. However, there has been, in the last 20 years, there has been quite a lot of academic research and work done on Wolsey's patronage. Well, to, to start with the means of it, Wolsey is very, very wealthy. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is because uh, he collects, with Henry's help, uh, at Henry's insistence, from the time that we've been talking about, he collects a series of ever more impressive ecclesiastical titles and uh, incomes because for each, um, each title is an income. So his first uh, Bishop of Lincoln, 
Um, he then becomes, in 1514, he becomes Archbishop of York. He has to give Lincoln up, but the Archbishop of York is, of course, this, uh, is the second highest and, and a very wealthy see. He's also the commendatory abbot of St. Albans. He's also, for a time, the Bishop of Bath and Wells. And so he's, he's got, by 15, 15, 15, 16, he's got um, quite a bit of money. And it's, uh, when is it, end of 14, end of 1514, early 1515, that he takes the lease on his most famous property, Hampton Court, Surrey, and immediately starts expanding it into the double court that we know now, the whole base court, the big outer court, which everybody knows when they first get there. That's all Wolsey's uh, work. Most of what we see there now is, of course, a whole hodgepodge of things from, from centuries that follow, but that was his first property. Be because he has the ear of the king, because by then he's also the Lord Chancellor, uh, as well as the Archbishop of York, uh, people come to him, people want to work with and for him. So he very quickly, and he needs people to do all the administrative stuff, and, and he's got to have a household which is commensurate with his status as bishop, as the Lord Chancellor of the realm. And of course, by 1515, he's also a cardinal. So he has to have a household that is commensurate with his status as a prince of the church. And that's very much what Hampton Court is about, and that, that he owns in his own right. With the bishopric of, Archbishopric of York also comes York Place uh, in Westminster, which is roughly, for those who know it, where the, the, the Ministry of Defence uh, is now in a, a, a Whitehall. So not very far from Westminster Hall, where he does his work as, as Lord Chancellor, mostly. And that, too, is a substantial place or palace on the river, uh, which he, he expands, increases, refurbishes uh, in order to, to accommodate his, 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 his entourage. And it's from there that he, kind of, as it were, commutes to work at Westminster Hall to and fro, um, with all his, you know, symbols of his office and all the rest of it, as Cavendish describes him doing. So uh, with that, he's also got, where, as the abbot of St. Albans, he also has the manor house of the Moor in Hertfordshire, which is as big, uh, not, not very much of it survives, but it's thought to have been as big as Hampton Court and probably looked a little bit like Hampton Court. Both Hampton and uh, the Moor have fashionable new long galleries that, that you allow you to sort of walk up and down, particularly bad weather like it is this morning in the southeast, very windy and rainy. You can stay inside and take your exercise and chat with your friends as you walk up and down. Very, very fashionable. And, and Wolsey is very conscious of his international status as an ecclesiastic, particularly as a cardinal. And uh, so he commissions tapestries from people. He buys tapestries on a small scale at first. Uh, he also inherits quite a bit from uh, some of the, his predecessors, the, the former Bishop of Lincoln and, and others. So uh, over time, he acquires quite a collection of, of tapestries, and only a few bits of which survive uh, now. He's an early patron of uh, Italian Renaissance sculpture, uh, perhaps most famously, the originally there were eight uh, roundels of classical figures. My friend Kent Rawlinson, who used to be at Hampton Court, has done a lot of research, which he's going to publish shortly, which will show, I think, quite convincingly, that what we all call the 12 Caesars at, uh, at Hampton Court are no such thing. They're one of the one of the least of whom is a woman. They're classical figures that, that allude to classical chivalry, to um, uh, heroic figures, uh, heroic kings and leaders of the past. And Wolsey commissions those. Uh, plus other work from De Maiano. Um, he's also a patron of another man called Benedetto da Rovezzano, who is the designer of his tomb. Ah, uh, yes, I was just going to say that. Yeah, yeah a big tomb project, which went right through um, his life. Uh, and so impressed was uh, Henry with it <laughs> that he got Rovezzano to start working on a, on a, um, a tomb project for him. And, and eventually, of course, the plan was to take over a lot of the stuff that, that Wolsey had for his tomb uh, and put it in Henry's. In the end, of course, neither was built. But there, there was a lot of work done. And one of the people who does all the business and, and for the settling up of, of Robert Zano's work is one Thomas Cromwell, very important, as we know, in Wolsey's life and afterwards. So uh, tapestries with architecture, with the... Um, the decoration of the, the, the spaces that he occupies. This is all designed to show Wolsey as, as a great patron in both senses of the term, you know, our modern sense of a 
patron of the arts, but also patron in, if you want to get on, the best way to do it is actually to come into the, the wider royal circle, which Woolsey more or less has, has the center of. Rather than, uh, as might have been the case 100 years before, you might want to go off into the service of some great noble like the Duke of Norfolk or the Duke of Buckingham or whatever. This is one of the things that, that political historians have looked at, is that Woolsey uh, plays a big role in trying to pull people more directly into what you might call the royal clientage or the royal affinity through offices in his household and then people who work for him often get uh, preferments at Henry's court in various roles which they have. So you see how the two things go together, the political patronage, the building of a following, an entourage and a personal court links into his work for Henry politically, but of necessity, he's got to have big palaces which are well furnished to have this big court. So that's that side of it. As to education, Woolsey's very interested in education for its own sake. Uh, he values his own education uh, at Oxford. He's very sympathetic to the new, although he's, he's quite conservative religiously himself, he's very uh, sympathetic to the so-called new learning, the, um, the studia humanitatis, um, you know, rhetoric, history, uh, philosophy, the, the, the kinds of um, educational fashionable education which people like Erasmus are advocating and Thomas More and, and others. So he's very much part of that circle, which is why he's got this incredible idea. I mean, Wolsey always does things on a grand scale. <laughs> so he had a plan, not only to completely revise the diocesan setup of, of England and Wales, but at least in England to have a, a feeder school, like a, like a grammar school, as we'd say, for each of the dioceses to uh, his institution at Oxford. What I mean, of course, is Cardinal College. Uh, it's now Christchurch, Oxford, the biggest, <laughs> it was then and it still is, <laughs> the biggest college in Oxford in terms of its area. Uh, and its great hall, of course, is famous to Harry Potter fans because <laughs> I'm not one of those. So it's in, the, it's in the Harry Potter film somewhere, Hogwarts or I don't know. But it is very, very impressive, the, the, the hall at, at Christchurch. Uh, and they, that huge, what's called Tom Quad, that vast um, quadrangle, almost sort of oversized, really, compared to some of the, the more refined colleges. Uh, but that's, that gives you, just, just stand in that space or stand at Hampton Court and look around you, and that tells you a lot about the man we're talking about. Yeah. But he wants to bring in, and he does, he sets up this college and he brings in scholars, equivalents of undergraduates and postgraduates who come in to do various courses, uh, he also pays for a number of professorships at the University at Oxford. So he was very conscious that Cambridge was um, was was further down the track. I mean, uh, they'd been patronised by people like Lady Margaret Beaufort and um, John Fisher, who were very much into this new, the so-called new learning. Uh, and Oxford was rather fusty and and you know uh, having to catch up. And Wolsey was determined that he'd help that process. So. He sets this college up and then, you know, like bishops before, the idea is to have a school which you train the boys at and then feed them into Oxford. The only one of which, of course, he sets up is in his hometown of Ipswich, which I think is fitting. Um, he's still remembered there for it. Not much of it survives. It's just the gatehouse. But it was up and running by about 1527, 28. Uh, and it was designed to be well, I mean, it, it makes it sound elite, but just like, for example, Eton was set up by Henry VI to feed into King's College at Cambridge, so St Mary's at Ipswich is set up to feed into Cardinal College, as, as I still call it. Uh, so uh, that was the only one. But there were to have, there was supposed to be, in the grand scheme of things, you know, one, many more at least, and in theory, one from every diocese. It gives you a sense of how much he, he values um, uh, education. All the other aspects of his material patronage go along with all of that. So obviously for, for church, for the college, etc., he's a great patron of books, uh, book collecting. He, he gets books, but I'm not sure they ever actually arrived, but he certainly writes to the, um, the, the St. Mark's Library in Venice, requesting copies of books, um, which they have and, and tracks, uh, you know, works in Greek and, and Latin. And so. Uh, he certainly, uh, and, and gold plate, of course, church plate, plate it, for use in, uh, in entertainment, etc. The Venetian ambassadors report that in all his houses he has a great sideboard of plate, you know, with stacked high with uh, gold and silver dishes, purely for display, and all the, 
kind of ostentatious magnificence, which was so much a part of the of the elite noble culture of, of Renaissance Europe. And Wolsey very quickly gets himself right up into all of that. And hardly any of it survives. Awful, I know. It's just terrible. Was, I was actually, just when you mentioned that, I just recently read an account of Henry's mm-hmm. visit to York Place just a couple of days after uh, Wolsey surrenders all his property. And yeah. the account sort of mentions how happy Henry was when he saw the place, not only the house, but the plate and, and all the yes. other luxurious things that were left behind. He thought, yes, I've struck it good, you know. Oh. Yes, it, it, it's, um, I mean, Wolsey was at least as wealthy as Henry um, yeah. up, until the, you know, up until his fall in terms of the, the property that he had and, and, and all of that. Uh, and he displays it, as I just said, in a manner that is composite with his status as a high ecclesiastic. And he is the highest ecclesiastic uh, in England, notwithstanding Archbishop Warren as, as, the, as the, the, the primate of all England, because Wolsey outranks him as a cardinal, and then particularly from 1518 as a cardinal legate, mm. um, the personal representative of the Pope in England, which got Wolsey into, um, as I'm sure we'll come on to, uh, a tricky yeah, a situation. Mess. <laughs> And Glenn, am I right in thinking that he also dissolved some, some of the smaller monasteries at the time in order to fund one of his college? Is that right? That's right, yes. Um, there's about, I can't remember off the top of my head, it's at least about 30 or 40 yeah. houses uh, in, in the southeast and uh, in East Anglia, some in the Midlands, um, which caused a great deal of unrest because, as I, I mentioned, the scale of the project. Uh, and the person who, of course, had oversight of it by the end was none other than Thomas Cromwell. And yeah, so so Wolsey dissolved. Dissolving monasteries was was not itself that problematic. And in fact, there was a great deal of debate. People like Moore and others, Fisher, um, had a great deal of sympathy with the view that there was just too much monasticism about. You know, right. Nothing wrong with it. Very good. But there was just too many houses that were you know, been founded in the 11th century and were once thriving communities, which were now, you know, three old men and a maid or something, um, not really doing very much. Some of them were probably burden on their local communities more than, and, you know, being of assistance to them, no longer really carrying out their functions. Mm. We needn't get into all the, the later accusations of, you know, laxity and, and all the rest of it, but it, it just needed, the whole thing needed, I don't know, tidying up and, and sorting and, you know, Woolsey was the man to do it. And so he started on these small, these small houses. But as you can imagine, when then there's any kind of big, what we might call a kind of public project, there's, there's objectors to, you know, what's going to happen to the livelihoods and he's riding roughshod over the rules. And, and in fact, it, it sort of comes back to, to haunt Wolsey in a way, because although he has the king's permission, he has the pope's permission, uh, he needs both to do this. The way it's done is sometimes said to be rough and ready and, you know, got ruffled people's feathers. And so it was very easy later to accuse him of overstepping the mark and, and really being very destructive to, to the, the monasteries. I don't think that's, that's really the case. As, as always with Wolsey, he probably pushed it a bit. He probably was, you know, he didn't tell people <laughs> everything they need to do. He probably cut corners in some of the legal work. And, but because he was driven on, I mean, he's always, he's a man in a hurry. Don't forget that, as I said, he, he's really, he, he only really comes into significant wealth and authority in his early to mid forties. And, uh, you know, he, he had, he, he did suffer from illnesses uh, from time to time. He, he seems to be in a fairly robust character, but he was subject to sudden onsets of illness. Uh, one or two of which wasn't everybody, of course, in the 16th century, but not that we know anything about plagues or contagions at, uh, ourselves, do we? I don't know. Um, Yes, but we're rapidly learning. But so I think he, he's I've described him as a cardinal in a hurry, and, and everything's got to be done, and it's got to be done on a great scale as well. It's got to happen and be there. So he would have been, I think, um, a very demanding man to work for. And I'm not surprised that it's the competence and capacities of that that he saw in Thomas Cromwell and all that training Cromwell had years ago. My friend Philip Warder, another Australian who studied with David, he wrote his dissertation on exactly this, Cromwell's Dissolutions for Woolsey. And you can see how Cromwell's learning, how it's done, where, where, where things are happening, getting to really get under the skin of, of what is happening in the monastic houses. And as Dermot McCulloch has argued in his biography of Cromwell, that that begins to inform Cromwell's attitude towards you know, reform and monasticism. 
So all kinds of unseen consequences from that great project of building Carlton College and, and the others. All right, so um, let's change the topic a little bit and talk about Wolsey and his relationship with the Berlins. So, Glenn, you know, obviously there's so much that's put out there on the internet and whatnot. Was their relationship really as hostile as it's sometimes made out to be, or did it just turn into that in the end? Well, funnily enough, I was talking about this only earlier this week. But, oh, good. Um, my thought is that Wolsey's... I've, I've described the kind of man he is. I've described yes. his bustlingness, his demandingness, I would have thought, and his origins, and put those two together with an unfortunate tendency to, uh, I think, what would be per perceived as arrogance. The business of always, whenever he goes anywhere, having his cardinal's hat born before him, you know, his crosses for York and his legged ship having people all carrying these two sometimes called maces or pillars representing his legatine status. I mean, really shoving it in people's faces all the time. You can see why, you know, the nobles, people like Buckingham, like, you know, the Howard family, the Norfolk and indeed the, the up and coming Berlins think, well, who is this man, you know? But there's nothing much they can do about it because it's also clear that he and Henry are bosom buddies, you know, um, and that what Henry wants, the Cardinal gives and what, the Cardinal does or doesn't want, Henry will give or give him. And you can't easily get around the two of them. Okay, the court, the royal court is a space where, and this is why people like the Berlins are important, because the royal court is a space where you can have some in, informal influence, you, you can make your views known, you, you, you can meet other people who have a similar view, um, ideas and, and patterns of action of working together can form a, a court. It's less easy to do much about Wolsey in his more formal capacities as Lord Chancellor and things. You've got to toe the line and do what he says. So that's just a way of prefacing that, that I think everybody probably found mm. Wolsey difficult. Everybody probably felt a bit hostile towards him, may have felt that he was hostile towards them. But when you actually look at the, the relationship with that particular family, there isn't a lot of, when you, when you, if you put aside some of the, the tittle-tattle and and it comes from Cavendish particularly, which was just his view of Wolsey and, and Anne, um, there isn't a lot of contemporary evidence of hostility. Tension, a, a willingness to, to see if, if Wolsey's powers with Henry can't be tested or should be tested, that there certainly is. Anne, prob Anne herself probably had no fascination with Wolsey's competence and all the rest of it. But the, the first Berlin with whom he's, with Wolsey deals, of course, is Thomas Berlin, Anne's father. And that relationship, I think, I mean, people debate about it, but that relationship seems to be difficult, but, but fairly typical. I mean, Woolsey must have thought Berlin was all right, because remember I was talking about the, the importance of the Treaty of Universal Peace in, the, in 1518 and the Anglo-French dealings. Now, it says to me that both Henry and Woolsey must have thought Thomas Berlin was pretty good, because he's made not just ambassador to France, but he's made the first resident ambassador which the English crown ever sends to France. And he conducts an embassy for about a year, which is in the really difficult run up to the field of cloth of gold with all that competition I was talking about, handling all of that, all the, um, the final six months is, is looked after by Sir Richard Wingfield, but most of it is looked after by Thomas. As we all know, by that stage, his daughters are at the, uh, the French court in the household of, of Queen Claude. <clears throat> and again, that I think speaks to him that he would facilitate that sort of finishing school fit for his daughters and we particularly think of Anne in that, that context and what that would do for her. The correspondence between him and, and Woolsey is as you'd expect. Sometimes Woolsey's happy with what he does, sometimes he's not. I think what Woolsey's trying to do is, is to in a sense make Woolsey, sorry, make Berlin one of his own and for Berlin that's not a bad thing you know, because if, if, if you're approved of by Wolsey then there's a good chance that Henry will also see you. So I, I don't think there's any outright hostility but David Head in his biography of, of Thomas Howell, the Duke of Norfolk, says that you know there, there was um, a good deal of tension between the two. The, the Berlins are trying to get in with, with the Howards um, you know who are themselves are really trying to get back to their full status as, as um, Dukes of Norfolk but what they have from 1514. So Everybody, I think, has some degree of hostility. To, to cut a long story short, I would say that that's what it's like all the way through the period uh, from when the annulment marriage, uh, the annulment case begins in, in sort of 27. And from there, it has to be very nuanced, I think, but 
I don't think they're out to get rid of Woolsey for the sake of it, but they want Woolsey doing what they want. And they're not sure he, he's really going to be able to do it. I mean, the, there's the famous thing in, in when it's in August 27, when he's a crossover in France negotiating yet another um, international, this time the Treaty of Eternal Peace um, <laughs> with Francis. <laughs> And he gets this letter from Fitzwilliam, William Fitzwilliam, saying that Henry is keeping a um, big house, uh, entertaining people, and the Berlins are there, Anne in particular. Uh, up until that point, I don't think Woolsey really comprehends that, Wal that Anne is quite as part of the mix for Henry as he should. But it, it's from that month that this decision is launched to bypass Woolsey and to send William Knight to the Pope directly with this basically, you know, a letter asking permission for a bigamous marriage, which isn't finally presented, but for a marriage to uh, a woman who is, once the um, marriage to Catherine has been annulled, uh, to any woman, including one who is in the same degree of affinity or consanguinity to, to Henry as Catherine is. And of course, everybody knows what that means. It's Henry that tells everybody that he wants to marry Anne, um, not Woolsey. And that changes the whole dynamic in Rome because people now know what this is really all about. In a way, Woolsey had never wanted them to. So she's sort of, the Berlin's get in the way very effectively, but I don't think um, very much to their own advantage at that point. And as we know, uh, as, as I think Cavendish tells us, that um, when he comes back from France at the end of 27, doing all of this, and, it all, and that mission you know, goes into the sand, he certainly does finally appreciate that, that Anne is at least as committed as Henry is to this whole thing, and that she's got to be dealt with seriously. And I think, but, but then in the following year, when, when there's plans for the um, Campeggio to come to England, and you know, it's all going to be resolved, there are those moments when, I think it's in, in March or April and Lent, when Anne writes to Woolsey saying, oh, you know, lovely, and how are you? And, yes. <laughs> can I have some fish from your lovely ponds at Hampton Court, please? You, know, you can see why <clears throat> she finds him frustrating, but who else is going to do the job at this point? Nobody's yeah. thinking that Henry's going to just do it by Parliament. So she may not like him, she may find him difficult, but she's prepared to work for him, provided he can show that he's up to the job. And at times he seems not to be, and at times he seems he is. And the more that goes on, the more frustrating it becomes. And certainly by the time of the Legatine Court in 1529, I think Anne is really just tired of the whole business. And at that point, if you if you want to say she wants, you know, Woolsey gone or whatever, uh, there, there's more to it. But as to, we may come on to the particular circumstances, but I don't think it's Anne Boleyn who brings about the fall of Woolsey. It's, and I don't think she intended to. What I think she wanted was Woolsey working for her agenda as fully as she comprehended, quite rightly, that Woolsey was working for Henry's agenda. It just took Woolsey a bit of time to work out that it was the same agenda um, for both of them. And he's got to be careful with her, but then also remember that the connections with France, which, which Anne has with the evangelical circle of the French court, Francis' sister, uh, Marguerite de Navarre, etc. I mean, they're quite useful for Woolsey to have is, if he's, if he's you know, perpetuating this idea of Anglo-French concord and union and it made a, it made sense for them to work together, if at all possible. Uh, so that's a very very long way of saying I don't think it's unremitting hostility. I think the business of Cavendish, because this is where it springs from, isn't it? Cavendish says that Wolsey's supposed to have stopped Anne marrying Henry yes, Percy. Yes, that's right. Um, yes, well, for a start, it wasn't it wasn't really who Anne would marry that was that Wolsey was concerned with. It, it was who Henry Percy was going to, to marry. Uh, the plan was for him to marry Mary Talbot. And, and th there's no actual evidence that Wolsey, I mean, Wolsey certainly spoke to Henry Percy and, and was very controlled of him because he was still technically his ward at that point uh, and was very rough with him. Mm. But and, and if that therefore leads to Anne feeling resentful, but I don't think, I, I certainly don't think the, the idea that he came in and on Henry's orders, I don't, I may be wrong, but I don't think there's any direct evidence that on Henry's orders, Wolsey broke the two of them up. Um, in the way that, that Cavendish talks about and in the way that is shown in films like And of a Thousand Days, for example, yeah. where it's, it's great drama. It alludes to tension and difficulty and Wolsey throwing his weight around and, and people not liking it. But I don't think there's any, you know, hatched conspiracy to get rid of the Cardinal from that point onwards, um, which is what Cavendish kind of implies in, in his biography. 
Now, mm -hmm. I think some people listening might be also surprised to hear that Woolsey had a couple of children. I don't know if everyone knows that. So what do we know about his children, their lives? Not a lot. Yes, he. Uh, we, we sort of forgot to mention in passing earlier. But one of the other things Woolsey did was he, he um, didn't get married, but, but he had uh, what, what I would call a, uh, is a partner. We would say a partner nowadays. I mean, sometimes she, her name is Jane or Joan Lark, uh, and uh, she was from uh, Thetford. She had some brothers who were in the church, and it may be through her brothers who both went on to work in different capacities for Woolsey and Henry. Uh, it may be through her brothers that she met Woolsey. And she's usually called his mistress or sometimes rather prissily, you know, his concubine. It reads to me as if they were what we've called partners. In other words, they, they never lived together uh, as such, but they were in proximity to each other. Um, for some time, it's, it's not known as about sort of, might be 10, 15 years or so that they were in what was clearly a sustained relationship. And it's not actually as unusual as it sounds. Of course, Wolsey's a priest, so he, he can't marry. He must be technically celibate. But there were lots of priests who had partners. And if you think about people like Edward Hall, the, the chronicler of, of Henry's reign, and Polydor Virgil, the, the Italian commentator who writes the history of England um, at the time, who's in England, you would think that if having a mistress, partner, whatever, was so scandalous, that would be the first thing. Because they find anything and everything they can say that's against Woolsey. You know, he was arrogant, so he was pro-French, he was, you know, ineffective, he was this, that, and the other. They say nothing about his relationship. And while it wouldn't have been flaunted at court or anything, people would have known. And uh, so they were together for some years, and they had a daughter called um, Dorothy. And she was, uh, she was brought up in a, in a foster family. Uh, and then she became a nun. And I think we know that because Cromwell provides a pension for her when the convent of which she's a part is dissolved. He arranges for her to be looked after. That's, uh, but we don't really know anything more about, about Dorothy. Uh, and uh, his son was called Thomas Winter. I don't know why he's called Winter. Maybe that's when he was conceived or born. And we know a bit more about him. He was... Uh, probably born, I think, in about 15, 10 or so, I'm judging from later references. He, again, is, is sort of brought up with, uh, he's acknowledged by his father as his nephew, as in the manner of cardinals, to, um, to acknowledge their sons as nephews. And he, um, he, he too has a sort of foster family situation, but then he goes to school and goes to university. He goes off to France in about, when is it, about 20... 26, I think, thereabouts. And the ambassador in France at the time, the English ambassador, helps him settle into some accommodation which is found for him because he's studying at, at the Sorbonne. Um, he has a, a Scots humanist tutor who works with him there. He doesn't seem to have been quite as bright. I think he goes to Italy for a bit, for a while, wanders around. He ends up with a number of sinecures, a number of priestly uh, positions. He enters the church like his father and ends up as dean of Bath at, at Woolsey's Fall. And we don't really hear very much more about him. And there are one or two references in correspondence to him. Um, and uh, But th th that seems to have been a reasonably effective relationship as well, so far as we, as far as we can tell. Um, and he certainly suffered no ill feeling or anything from Henry when Wolsey uh, fell from power. So, yeah, it is, it is interesting. But, again, it, it's something that was probably vastly unusual. There was a the theory and then the practice, which everybody kind of knew but didn't talk about. All right, Glenn, I think I, I, I can't let you go, of course, without asking you about Wolsey's downfall. Now, I know this is a very kind of drawn out complicated yes. issue but yes. perhaps you could just give us a little sort of summary of the events leading up to yes. Wolsey's arrest and and you've already said that you don't think it was you know the fault of Anne or the Berlin faction as such so maybe you could tell us what you do think <laughs> contributed right. to this okay. oh. right well I'll try and keep it as, as simple as I as I can but the the failure of the Legatine court the fact that Campeggio doesn't resolve the question in Henry's favour at that and prorogues it and that necessitates Henry or the case being revoked to Rome to be heard by the Pope there. That is a disaster for Wolsey, no doubt about it. It's the dead end of the road that he's been advocating since 1527 and Henry is not pleased. 
worse though from Wolsey's point of view is remember I said in, he'd been in, in France in 27 organising the eternal peace well in the following two years Francis and, and uh, Charles and technically Henry have also been at war but without really telling Wolsey or Henry Francis and Charles have reached a settlement of their differences at the Treaty of Cambrai uh, in August of 1529. Now that is a big, big, big disaster for Wolsey because like I've been saying, way back since 1514, nothing has happened of any consequence in Western Europe without Wolsey there, Henry there, everybody you know, pivoting around what Henry wants because of Wolsey's amazing di diplomatic capacities. Wolsey can't do that because he's stuck at the Legatine court and Henry won't let him so much as lift his bum off the seat until the job's done. You know? But he can't be in two places at once. And suddenly, Cambrai means that not only is, is Henry likely to be summoned to Rome, but also his, his great means of, of uh, keeping, him, keeping Charles and Francis apart has, has come to an end. They've reached their own settlement. He is technically in, in, incorporated in it and... and in fact, they, they get back into the game relatively quickly. But it's a big disaster. And I think that is the point where Henry really does think this this is it, um, that I, I don't really see what I can do with him anymore. I think it's it's what Henry's thinking, which is most important. Don't get me wrong. If, if Henry is feeling down on Wolsey and looking to probably get rid of him, you can bet Anne Boleyn was alongside saying, yes, dear, I'm sure that's a very good idea. Look at all these lovely other young men who we've got who can do just as good a job as, as, as Wolsey. Power begins to, certainly in that autumn, power begins to go from Wolsey. Uh, Stephen Gardner becomes the royal secretary, he being Wolsey's secretary, and he becomes the royal secretary, and his attitude changes overnight you know, to, to Wolsey. And uh, Wolsey hardly sees the king. Um, I think George Bernard actually argues he doesn't see the king at all, really, from early August um, till September. The famous meeting at Grafton in September when Campeggio is going to go back to Rome and there's no rooms for, for Wolsey provided. And uh, Wolsey and the king do see each other. Henry treats Wolsey with, with great respect and everything seems to be all right. Uh, at one point, he and Anna, Wolsey goes off, I think, to dine with the council, and, and Henry and Anna are dining together. And, you know, she makes clear that Henry is making too much of a fuss of, of Wolsey. Um, and he says, well, I, I know you're not his friend, you know, which I think is an accurate summary. <laughs> Wolsey then sees Henry the following day briefly, and that's when Anne does the business about, well, let's go off and <clears throat> look at this new hunting park. And after that, I mean, Wolsey never sees Henry again after that day. And uh, as we know from Tudor history subsequently, that's always a very bad sign. Yes, it is. <laughs> you see the, uh, if you don't see the king. Then comes the, the business of, what, well, what are we actually going to do with him? And I think Henry is so angry. He starts not, uh, I said this uh, in, in a lecture recently, that for since 1514, or 15 rather, Henry has seen Wolsey as his cardinal. I think Peter Gwynne's great biography 25 years ago, Wolsey called the king's cardinal is right. That that's how Henry sees him. He's the king's cardinal. He can do anything, he can do everything, and then suddenly he can't, even though he is a cardinal. He now begins to see in the person of Wolsey the Pope's cardinal. Uh, and other people have been telling him that. So Francis Bryan tells him that almost in terms a few years earlier. Anne, I'm sure, has been saying that. But he now really sees him as the problem, and the church as the problem, and that they've got to bring pressure on the papacy to do what they want. So uh, that autumn, there is lots of legislation, anti-clerical legislation. You know, Henry's heard of, of these clerical abuses and, and, and um, things that they're doing which they shouldn't be. This must all be reformed, you know, and that's what the agenda for the first, for the, for the 1529 Parliament is. Then comes the charge against Wolsey of premenurae, which is um, acknowledging an authority um, above the kings outside the realm, which is which church people in particular, though anybody, but church people in particular are liable to. And that to me is, is obviously, that's the legal means to, to act against Wolsey, to, to hit him, not as the chancellor, not as the king's servant, but as a high-ranking ecclesiastic, you know, and the highest-ranking ecclesiastic in, in England, to, to charge that individual with the crime of premenurae is to say something very directly about the hierarchy and the authority in England, that it's the king's authority. And Wolsey sees that straight away. I mean, he, um, 
he, he knows it, it's a legal fiction, perfectly clear that he was made a cardinal and a legate with Henry's permission and at his insistence. So he, so he plays it politically as well. He won't contest it. He just admits the charge and throws himself on, on Henry's mercy. Which leads to the next thing. Um, you can't have the highest ranking churchman in England charged with premonuri running the parliament, because that's what he has to do as Lord Chancellor, or in charge of the king's legal system. The great, it, it's the great irony is that Henry had brought these two roles together, church and state, in the person of Wolsey, and now he's desperately pulling, pulling it apart. So you can't have Wolsey presiding over the opening of Parliament. You can't have him sitting in judgment as Lord Chancellor. So that's why he's sacked as Lord Chancellor uh, in October uh, 29. Um, <clears throat> and then, as you mentioned earlier, he's told to give up your place and go to Isha. And uh, because he's, he's pleaded guilty in Premonuri, all his possessions, etc., cetera, are, are forfeited to the king. Um, and as you said, they, 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 it's all trussed up in baskets and boxes and, and taken off to Greenwich and, and, uh, and Wolsey heads off to Isha. And then he reaches a, a settlement with Henry, a very good settlement of about £5,000, which is, you know, about a week's yearly worth uh, in, when is it, in February 1530. And he's told, right, you, you've got your money and we don't know what you just, just, why don't you go to York? And he says, um, well, I, I could go to Winchester because at one point he's also become briefly Bishop of Winchester. And, uh, they say, no, why don't you go to York? You've never been there. Uh, um, the Archbishop, isn't it about time you went and saw your diocese? Um, and um, Wolsey kind of reluctantly says, that's all right then. Uh, and so he sets off um, in, it's relatively late, uh, in uh, March, April, 1530, and takes a long, long, takes months to get up to York. He's not there till late October, you know, early November. Uh, I won't go into all the, the details of what's happening, but it's a very busy year down in, in the capital. Henry is moving rapidly against uh, the Pope. Uh, in June comes the letter that he demands all the nobles, including Wolsey, the, the clerical and secular nobles, sign this letter demanding that the case be resolved and heard in England. And he's really beginning to, I think Jack Scarrow's book in his biography of, of, of Henry says, it's the summer of 1530 that Henry really shifts to imperial kingship I will have, I'm not asking for a favour, I am expecting to have done what is my right, and that's the way to look at it. I'm not the supplicant. I am entitled to have my marriage annulled for the reasons I've stated, and it is the papacy that's at fault, and that is that shift, and Wolsey uh, is sort of caught up in that. Now, what can we do to really emphasise that? Wolsey has been, through that summer, in contact with the, both the French and the imperial ambassadors, sending letters which are asking for favour, asking for, for them to intercede on his behalf. Now, is that treason in itself? No, um, he, had, he had often asked for such letters before. They'd often been given. It was quite standard. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. He also had written to Charles asking that, you know, Catherine should be given every assistance to ensure that her case was conducted correctly. Is that treasonous? No. Even Henry, she's entitled to, to that. But at one point, he does write something about maybe the, maybe the secular arm should be brought in to bring about the change which is needed. Um, and it's thought that what he really meant was that, that the Pope should tell Henry to put away Anne Boleyn under threat of schism or threat of you know, excommunication or whatever, censure. Is that treason? Well, <laughs> it might not. Getting close. <laughs> In the circumstances, it's sailing pretty close to the wind, particularly as he's not aware that the king is shifting quite with, with the wind in the way that he is. And then uh, through the, he has a physician called uh, Agostini, who's with him, etc., and who's often sends letters and is, is the, 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 the go-between between the ambassadors. It, eventually, it's alleged that what he'd done at one point was to suggest that Francis should foment war with Henry, and that would drag, sort of drag the papacy uh, and Charles V into war. That, if it's true, probably would constitute treason. There is actually no evidence that he ever said that. It supposedly, it was written in a letter that Agostini inadvertently destroyed, but actually remembered it all word for word in his head. Honest, Gov, I, I, re I remember word for word what I wrote, but I just I can't find it. I must have thrown it away. 
and to me that that's where the whole conspiracy thing starts to break down because uh, there are other bits of correspondence um, but the whole thing was lots of different things that Woolsey had said and done etc different points are all pulled together and stitched together into a kind of allegation of conspiracy but in such a way that when it's when it's made known to Francis I uh, in 1530 uh, what what the allegation is, in such a way that there's no real implication that Francis knew about it or whatever. The whole thing is designed to skewer Woolsey. Now, why is that? Is that because Anne Boleyn has sort of come out from the background and now she's seizing her chance to direct this and she's, you know, her uncle Norfolk is, is one of the people who's involved in putting the allegations together. And I, No, I don't think so. Equally, I think she probably is happy to go along with it, very much so. But it's really Henry. Henry wants it, it, Henry wants to make an example of Wolsey. Henry wants to have Wolsey back in his power in a way he's never had him before, at his mercy, and in a way that implies that the church, right up to the top, the Catholic church, is conspiratorial against him. Call Henry paranoid if you want, but that's how he saw it. And so I think Wolsey is charged with treason for all those various reasons that I that I, uh, I suggested. Not because Henry genuinely believes that that Wolsey is plotting against him, but because he wants him under control. And I don't think he knows quite what he wants to do with it, but he certainly wants him back in London or near him in in prison. Who would not want Wolsey anywhere near the king? Well, Anne, her family, the Howards. They, they say as much. So if if Henry wanted to ask Wolsey about these things and have him back and, and sort it all out, that was the last thing they wanted. But they might not have objected if he'd been actually charged with yes. a very serious crime. And so that's why Wolsey, I think, is why Wolsey is arrested. It is interesting, isn't it, that it's Percy, Henry Percy. Yes, I was going to ask you that. Do you think that's just a coincidence? or No, I didn't go into it enough to, to discover whether, you know, he asked for the job or... or it's a, it's a twist in the knife or somebody suggested, why don't you send him? You know, he's a senior ranking nobleman. Of course, you would expect someone of high rank. It's not going to be Norfolk or somebody to, uh, to arrest Wolsey. So it, it could just be practicalities, but it, it's a nice and terrible irony that, um, that that happens. So yeah, Wolsey is being brought back down to London and he begins to suffer uh, from, I think it's, dysentery really we, we call it certainly stomach upset and diarrhea and etc which just gets worse and worse uh, and he gets weaker and weaker until he comes to Leicester uh, Leicester Abbey where there's now the, the gardens and and a, um, just a, a rather small monument to him and he stays there in the the last days of his life and denies um, explicitly denies according to Cavendish any any plot that he'd ever done anything uh, against Henry uh, and uh, yes, dies there um, on the 29th of November, 1530. My last point on this is I don't necessarily, I say in the book, I don't necessarily think had he got back to London, he would have been A, necessarily put on trial quickly, or B, executed. I mean, we mustn't no. read into the events of, uh, shall we, the, the sad events of six years later, mm. <laughs> um, uh, into, the, into 1530, because... I mean, Henry, if you think about it, he's much more useful to Henry alive, you know, as a as a cardinal at his in prison, effectively in the tower. And you know, what what might that have done? And what would killing him have done? Would killing him have actually helped the situation? I mean, I think Henry wanted what he wanted, but he didn't want to antagonise the Pope unnecessarily. But if he's alive, you know, um, maybe that maybe that might just have worked. You know, the Pope might have said, "Okay, fine, we'll we'll, we'll do this." I, I don't know, but I don't think there's anything that we can see in from Cavendish's account of, of his last conversation with Henry. Something tells me that Henry didn't really know what he wanted to do with, with Wolsey beyond having him in his control in a way that was effective and acceptable to those around him, including, let's face it, the Berlins, etc. So uh, in his power, and then he would see what he would do with him. Um, because Wolsey would have contested he would have contested in open court that charge. And if Henry knew that it was basically, you know, a police verbal, <laughs> that they'd got all this stuff together from all over the place and cobbled it together into a kind of confession, effectively, 
that, that wouldn't stand up. Um, already, uh, the Manchurian ambassador writes and, um, and says, you know, this, all this stuff is just nonsense, really. So there we go. Um, that's my take. But in the end, you know, everybody was spared it. And, and Henry was able to indulge the, you know, in the luxury of grief about oh, um, <laughs> lots of rules, et cetera, who he was probably quite glad to have out of the way. Um, but then he soon came to regret it. But it didn't teach him, did it? Because he went No, on. it didn't. He continued doing it, didn't he? That's for sure. One other thing yeah. that I just wanted to ask you very quickly. So is there any evidence to suggest that he had been murdered, firstly, Wolsey, that is, or any evidence to suggest that he had taken his own life? The answer to both of those is is no. Um, generally speaking, I think it's David Starkey who said something like that, that it, it's, it, the English don't use daggers or poison. You know, that's the business of the French and the Italians. The English use the law um, to kill each other with. Um, which is borne out uh, later on. No, I'd, uh, Agostini is this shadowy kind of physician. I guess he would, he might have been uh, slipped him something and made him ill. No one will ever know this. There's no suggestion of that. He did suffer from gastric illnesses quite often, um, even if he was uh, generally in, in good health. I think the stress and the tension and the fear that if he if he did have you know an outbreak of gastroenteritis or whatever, then the the the, the sheer tension etc that he was under he, he was frightened because he gets very worried and you know writes to Cromwell and talks to people around him and he doesn't want to go to the tower you know because he knows what happens to people he'd seen what happened to Buckingham he really is frightened he is frightened of, of Anne I mean it is it is Woolsey who, to, who, who calls Anne the night crow <laughs> and that he, he realizes her her influence so that could well have exacerbated yeah. the problem yeah. um, and brought about a, an untimely death uh, and that he was uh, he committed suicide, there just is no... no I, I just couldn't believe what I was watching when I saw the Tudors when, when they had him cut his own throat. I mean, there's just no need. No, there is... Good. I like to clarify and do a bit of myth busting while we're at it. That's always good. Yeah, and Glenn, you've been no so... Reason. Sorry, you've been so wonderful. I've kept you for so long, but I'm wondering if you have time for me to do the, the quick end to the episode, which we like to do, which is 10 quick questions just to get to know you a little bit better. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll yes. do it fast, don't worry. Favourite <clears throat> childhood book? Oh, no. Um, Gumnut, what's the Australian uh, Wombat? Oh, um, they, yes, now um, I've forgotten the name too. <laughs> Blinky Bill, excellent. My what? favourite childhood book was Blinky Bill, yes. Oh, that's lovely. And what's something you love about where you currently live? Something I love about I currently live is uh, Sunbury is, is a nice little suburb and I live not very far from the River Thames and I can walk down to the little shopping centre. There's a nice Italian cafe, have a little cappuccino or whatever and have a little walk along the river, particularly if it's a nice day at this time of year. And what is the best film or the best show that you've watched this year? Will sound very weird, but um, Casablanca. <laughs> I watched Casablanca again um, just the other day. It's such a fantastic film. Um, I haven't seen it uh, in a long time. I should probably rewatch it as well, actually. Yes. Um, no, I just I was struck again. I had not seen it for years and years and years, and and uh, it just came came on telly here, and I thought I have never really properly appreciated this film. <laughs> it's it's very funny. It's very dramatic. It's you know, got marvelous scenes in it. So excellent. And what type of music do you enjoy? I'm very much a, a classical music fan uh, and very much uh, Baroque and classical. So Corelli and Vivaldi, and I, I like all the, the kind of medieval and all the stuff from this period, the 16th century, love, polyphony and talus and everything. Um, uh, fairly wide ranging up into up until sort of the, the 19th century. But I, my home is classical. Although I do like lots of pop and stuff. and Bopped around as a, as a younger person as much as anyone else. And as a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? A pilot. Oh, okay. uh, it, turned out, it turned out I couldn't add two and two together. Um, <laughs> I, just, I just didn't seem to have the brain for, for that sort of thing. I was hopeless at physics and stuff. So, And an actor. So you have to judge for yourself which of the two I got closest to. But, um, <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, do you I'm have any doing. pets? Well, interestingly, um, I don't technically have a pet, but the neighbour's cat his real name is Boris, but he reminds me very much because uh, of his colours. Um, those who are uh, friends of mine on Facebook see him often. His colours um, remind me of uh, a painting of Francis I 
um, which he's got grey and black and brown, which were his, his, his livery colours, the, the, the famous Clouet portrait of Francis. And this cat's forearms have got sleeves of fur, just like that. And um, he also was a great rival to another orange cat, who I christened Henry, of course, so, who's now since moved on. But um, uh, so he's a neighbour's cat. He comes to see me in my flat probably every day. And, you know, I don't feed him anything, but we have cuddles on the sofa and he chats away. So uh, I sort of feel as if I do have a pet by proxy called... Yeah, Prince I think Robert. that qualifies, definitely. And what is yeah. a dream holiday destination? Dream holiday destination is um, I would like to go to Vietnam. I've never been. Okay. Uh, I don't particularly know where in Vietnam, but I've always, because uh, I you know, grew up as, as a child during the, the Vietnam War, it was very big in Australia, obviously. And I've just been always fascinated by Vietnam and, and how, you know, this, this great evil, terrible country that, you know, was being fought for, etc. turned out to be <laughs> a pretty amazing yeah. um, Asian country in its own right. And, and uh, that's, I'd, I'd spend, you know, a month or more looking around Vietnam if I could. Yeah, very beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And lucky last question, what advice would you give to any people that are thinking about studying history or pursuing a career as a historian? Any wise words for them? Well, it is tricky. I think right around the, the Western world these days, the humanities are, are pretty well under stress even yeah. before we got COVID and all the rest of it. I, I think, I mean, if, if as I said, do say to prospective students, if, if you uh, don't want to be a pilot, or an astrophysicist or whatever, and well, if you want to be those, go and be those by all means. But certainly for studying history, uh, if, if that's the way you're inclined, it's a very good discipline because, I mean, I studied law a little bit um, as part of my undergraduate degree as well, and there's a good affinity between the two that both require you to master a good deal of, of information and, and evidence, require you to exercise your brain in uh, accounting for that and sifting it and in thinking logically about it. Uh, it also requires, history requires you to express yourself both verbally and um, and on paper uh, in a reasonably articulate way. It, it develops skills of cognition and expression, uh, which I think can be transferred, is the buzzword, but, but really can be transferred to lots of different other professions and, and work as you get older and as you develop a sense of what it is you do want to do. So it would never be, would never be time wasted. Uh, I find, my, obviously I find the past, what people have done in different contexts, how they've organized themselves. I find that always very fascinating. And while you can't directly apply Tudor history to, to modern times, and I don't believe history repeats itself in quite the way people think, um, it nevertheless is um, a storehouse of example, a storehouse of, of warnings, of, of just different perspectives on things. So I think to, to equip yourself with that, ideally with a language as, as well, if possible, um, is, is, a, is a good way forward and is, and is very rewarding in that way. They're very wise words. Thank you. And Glenn, thank you so much. You've been so generous with your time and with sharing your expertise with us. I'm really very grateful that you've come on the show. Absolutely pleasure. You're very welcome. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. <music> <laughs>